morning. Would you stand with us? We're excited to have the choir returning. Let's praise our great God. Praise is right. day so far. I am because the Cowboys don't play until this afternoon. <laughs> Woo! That business meeting might be rough tonight. I don't know. Hey, you know what? I just want to take a minute and get myself in a little bit of trouble, but I don't know if y'all noticed that Steve Stamens is back on the base <laughs> over here. And if you don't know why that's a big deal, it involves terms like tumors and cancers and swelling and all kinds of stuff, and we're just praising God uh, for, for him being back where he's wanted to be for a while, just hadn't been able to, 
And, uh, but that doesn't mean that you're not welcome to play an instrument if you can play an instrument or if you want to learn to play an instrument. Talk to Daniel if you're just going to uh, be like my wife and threaten to come up here and play chopsticks or something like that. That's not what we're looking for. We're excited to be here to worship the Lord this morning. If you uh, have your bulletin, you're going to notice, as always, that connection card in there. Please, 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 if you're a guest, if you're a first or second time attender, if you'll share a little information with us, we would so appreciate that. We want to get to know you better. Also, on the back of that card, you should share prayer requests with us. Uh, we do take our time every week to pray over the requests we receive as a staff. Sometimes we have a few and sometimes we have a lot. You can also share those with us online through our website uh, if you have any questions about that. I hope you're liking how the uh, remodel is coming along. We're, we are inching closer and closer. A lot of people are working really hard. We're getting ready to host the uh, Baptist Convention in New Mexico in the uh, third week of October. And so that's kind of uh, what we're hoping to really be ready for as well as just our weekly worship. So as we uh, enjoy that this morning, let's stand up, uh, stretch those legs again a little bit. I know you've been sitting for all of five minutes. It's time to get over that. Stand up and greet one another. Say good morning to somebody. Wave at the people in the choir so they don't feel left out. back to your seats. Sing this great hymn of the faith about our walk with Christ. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same.
from sin itself to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy. Read this with me from John 14. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Bring the presence of the risen Lord to renew my heart and make me whole. Cause your to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I cannot see. Give me passion for your purity. Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. of the Trinity. Keep singing with us. Again on earth, 
Lord, we do praise you for the fact that you are not some regional God like so many people have worshipped throughout time, and you're not some limited God with a few powers or a few specialties. And Lord, you're not some capricious God or immoral God. You're holy, perfect, and pure. You're all-knowing and all-powerful and all-loving. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation you bring us, and thank you, Lord, for using us in the ways that you do. Help us this morning to believe that you would use us to point others to you. And I would pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. If most of us had seen that uh, lanky farm boy, we probably wouldn't have thought much of him, wouldn't have considered him to be all that. When he went forward for salvation, we probably would have rejoiced as we do with anybody who receives Christ and is moved from eternal death to eternal life, and then we probably would have moved on. But thankfully, there was a guy named Albert McMacken who cared enough to invite him to the service, and there was a preacher named Mordecai Ham who was faithful to preach the gospel, and so it was that that lanky farm boy named Billy Graham did become a Christian, and you might have heard of him. He impacted a few people for Christ. I want to talk today about influence. You might not think you have a whole lot of influence, but influence is kind of like gravity. Every being, everything with mass produces gravity. Now that's not an insult about how much you weigh, that's just a reality. We produce gravity, and, and some people have what's called gravitas. And that is an influence. And the reality is you influence people. And you can influence somebody in a positive way or you can influence somebody in a negative way. And I want, to think, I want us to think about how, how important this is. Now as we consider this, I always get a kick out of how as adults we lecture the teenagers you need to not be so susceptible to peer pressure, kids. Stop being so susceptible. If they jumped off a cliff, would you jump off the cliff too? <laughs> Good thing we as adults aren't susceptible to peer pressure. Have you ever looked at any old pictures of yourself? <laughs> you ever look at how you were dressed and go, oh, Lord. That's not good. That's a terrible idea. Who, who said that looked good? And it's not just that. It's in so many ways. In fact, we have another term with it. It's called keeping up with the Joneses. Well, when we think about influence, it's become such a phenomenon in our society that in social media we have people who are called influencers. I'm not, having, having seen a few of them, I'm not exactly sure who they're influencing, but okay. But you and I have a job. We have a role. We have a responsibility. Not to just post whatever on social media, not just to try to dress a certain way or help other people dress a certain way. We need to be influencing people for Jesus Christ. And that's our role. And that's the best influence we'll ever have. And we need to understand that as we go through our days, just through how we act, how we live, how we talk, the habits we have, we, we can influence people around us for Christ. And we need to strive and, and hope that we can influence everyone possible around us for Christ. Because you never know what they'll do. As we've gone through this character sketches, this, uh, this series on character sketches in the book of Acts, and what do we learn from them? We're going to look at uh, today at a guy named Luke, and we know about Luke, and we've heard of Luke. 
Luke is really interesting in how he comes up, how he pops up in the book, book of Acts. We first meet him in Acts chapter 16. Sometimes when you're reading the Bible, it's the little things that you need to pay attention to. In Acts chapter 16, verse 6, you read the third person pronoun. For those of you who slept through grammar class, that's when somebody is talking about somebody else, okay? It's they. But what do you read in verse 10? You read, we. That little shift from they to we tells you that Luke is now part of Paul's missionary team. And that's really cool. See, Paul went on the second missionary journey. He teamed up with Silas. And then they went to north from there. Remember, we met Silas when he... he uh, went from Acts 15 from the Jerusalem Council, and he went as an emissary from, from Jerusalem to, to carry the good news. Hey, you know, we want to encourage you Gentile folks. And so we met Silas, and so Paul and Silas took off along the way. They picked up another guy named Timothy. And then as they continued on, they picked up this guy named Luke. Now, in the second missionary journey, something really interesting is going on. Because Paul had wanted to head in a few different directions, and God said, no, you can't go that way, you can't go that way, you can't go that way. And then there's a lot of supposition as to why that was the case. We don't know if any of those are correct, but we just know that Paul wasn't able to head in any of those directions. But finally, there comes this one night, Paul's asleep, he has a dream, he has a vision of a guy from Macedonia. Macedonia is northern Greece. And, and, and so this guy from Macedonia says, please come help us, right? And so Paul receives that call, and, and then it says, okay, here we go. And they took the gospel to Europe. And, and as we get to know Luke, we, we, we understand why more and more he was a good candidate for Paul's team. And we can fill in some blanks with some verses. You go, why did he originally get asked along? Not everybody that Paul met got invited to, to can go on the journey with them, but Luke did. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Now Paul says of himself, especially because of the extraordinary revelations, therefore, now what does that mean? That means Paul had been shown some amazing things. God had shown Paul amazing things, including a vision of heaven. And so he said, so that I would not exalt myself. Now, this is a really important side note, by the way. Scripture's clear. You can either humble yourself or God will humble you, humble you. Of those two recommendations, I would say humble yourself. Paul had such a great revelation from God that God sent Paul what he calls here a thorn in the flesh. It was given to me a messenger of Satan to torment me, so I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in my weaknesses, insults, catastrophes, persecutions, and then pressures because of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So Paul had this these great revelations, this great role, this great call, and in that, God had given him a physical ailment, and, and he refused to heal it. So, by the way, there's a, there's a pretty big strike against what we call the health and wealth gospel, that if you just claim it, God will heal you no matter what. Well, it didn't work for Paul. Do you think Paul had enough faith? Yes, I do. Did Paul not heal others? Yes, he did, through the power of God in him. But when it came to him, God said no. So he was left with this physical element. In Galatians 4.13, it says, You know that previously I preached the gospel to you because of a physical illness. So Paul was struggling with these things. And so in Colossians 4.14, we find out perhaps... The original reason why Luke accompanied Paul. Luke, the dearly loved physician. And Demas, greet you. So Luke was a doctor. 
And, and that makes sense to us. Okay, perhaps that's why he originally accompanied Paul to help him with his illness. And it could have been left at that, except that that's not who Paul was, nor does it turn out that's who Luke was. Well, what do I mean? Well, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and he was an evangelist, but he was not just an evangelist. God had packed Paul so full of theological truth. Here's what you should think about God and ethical truth. Here's how we live in obedience to God that I think it was just bursting out of Paul. It just, I don't think you had to hang around Paul for very long before he started talking about God, before he started talking about the truth of who God is, before he started talking about how we live as the people of God. It's just what Paul did. And so he had all of this. And he, he didn't mince words either. Paul was one of those guys that, you know, you, you'd probably hear him, well, well, Paul, tell me what you really think, you know. In other words, he didn't mince words, and he was to the point, and he was direct. And so it's at this point, Peter even makes this statement about Paul. Now, Peter's an apostle, right? He's one of the leaders. He's one of the main guys. And so he also read some of Paul's writings, just like we get to. And what does he say in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 16? He says, Also regard the patience of our Lord as an opportunity for salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things in all his letters in which there are some matters that are hard to understand. The untaught and unstable twist them to their own destruction as they also do the rest of Scripture. Now there's two really interesting things said there. The first is this. Have you ever read Romans or something like that, or maybe something out of 1 Corinthians, and maybe Galatians, and you know, you're reading along and you go, ooh, I think I need a Tylenol. I'm not sure I really understand what he's talking about here. Well, if you've ever struggled a little bit to understand Paul's writings, apparently Peter says, welcome to the, welcome to the group. So I don't know if that encourages you or not. But also it's so fascinating here that Peter, when he writes about Paul's writings, he says, as they also do with the rest of scriptures. What does that tell you about what Peter thinks about what Paul wrote? He qualifies it as scripture. He qualifies it as he understood that Paul was inspired of the Holy Spirit. So this is Paul. Now Paul wasn't always right. Sometimes his, uh, we'll, we'll call it urgency, uh, led him to a harshness in which he was too quick to dismiss other people. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But that's Paul. We, we know Paul. We're familiar with Paul. Well, what about Luke? Well, we know one thing about Luke so far. He was a doctor. And as we think about that, that may not impress you. Maybe because somewhere along the line you've met a few doctors. And if you're a nurse here, you can, you can probably tell us a whole lot more about this. But uh, maybe you haven't been impressed with every doctor you've come across. Or maybe you think, well... Doctors back then, it's not like doctors now. You know, they didn't have all the medical understanding that we do. Still, to be a doctor, you needed to be an intelligent person. You needed to be a person who was willing to work hard and learn what there was to learn. And so we don't want to just dismiss it. Luke, he, he showed this, this insatiable curiosity, especially concerning things of the Lord. And, and this is really important for us because it's to our benefit. He demonstrated this. So he was taught by Paul, but he didn't stop there. Now, good for us, Luke did not just accumulate knowledge for himself. I've known a lot of Christians like that. They've been through so many study courses that they are just full of knowledge, and they're not doing a blessed thing with it. 
Luke turned out to do some writing. And he, in many senses, was the first Christian apologist. You say, well, what is an apologist? Well, apologetics is a, a discipline of, of Christianity in which we strive to answer questions and defend the faith. It, it, the word itself is used in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where Paul, uh, Peter writes, and he says, Honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a, def a defense or an apologetic. The apologia in, in, in Greek is the root of that. For the reason, to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is within you. So let's talk about Luke's writings. Pretty much anybody who knows what the books of the Bible are can guess one of the books Luke wrote. It's called Luke. Right? I think pretty much everybody knows Luke wrote Luke. And most of you know that Luke also wrote Acts. And that should have been kind of obvious from earlier when I talked about the pronoun shift from they to we. Well, what's the big deal about this? Well, Luke's writings had two distinct qualities. Number one, he did a lot of research before he wrote. He did a lot of research before he wrote. Number two, as I was just talking about, he wrote to defend Christianity specifically from persecution by the Roman Empire. Now consider how he started the two bo books he wrote. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The first part of Luke, we read this. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. It also seemed good to me since I have carefully investigated everything from the first to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. There are some really important words in here that it's easy for us to gloss over. First of all, the words carefully investigated. Now we know what those words mean, right? And we see the evidence of that in Luke's writings. He carefully investigated. And he ended up having some more detail in some important areas of the Gospels than the other Gospel writers. For instance, the birth narrative. It's hard to believe. We're on the verge of fall. According to my wife and one of my secretaries, it's been fall for about three weeks. I'll let you guess who I'm talking about. And then, pretty quickly, the choir that was singing this morning will start rehearsing Christmas music. They already are. They're like Walmart and Hobby Lobby. They have already got all their Christmas <laughs> stuff out. And it's coming. And if you want to read the most comprehensive, detailed, best telling of the birth narrative, which gospel do you go to? You go to Luke. And I've always found this fascinating. It's such an interesting story to me if we think about why that's the case. Well, we've got to back up. First of all, we understand, well, he was a doctor. Of course, there were certain things he would understand a little better than, you know, Mark or John or Peter. Peter and John were fishermen. What do they know about birth? You know, unless it's fish, maybe. And, and, and so, okay, what, what does that matter? Well, Acts chapter 23, verse 11. Now we're in the part of Acts when Paul's been through not only the second missionary journey, but the third missionary journey. And on the way home from the third missionary journey, there was a lot of drama. There was a lot of tears. And everybody uh, along the way is telling Paul, don't go back to Jerusalem. 
If you go back to Jerusalem, you're going to get arrested. If you go back to Jerusalem, you're going to get arrested. And Paul says, I know I'm going to get arrested when I go back to Jerusalem. So he goes back to Jerusalem because there's some very important other things going on. And I don't have really time to go into those, but he really, really wanted to personally hand deliver the offering from the Gentile churches to the Jerusalem church. That's, that's really why he went. And, and so while he's there, there's a big brouhaha at the temple. Paul gets arrested on false charges. And in there, in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, God told Paul, you're going to go testify for me in Rome. You're going to go to Rome. I'm going to make sure you go to Rome, and you're going to testify for me in Rome. Rome is the capital of the empire, remember. Now, well, what does that matter? Well, from the point when Paul got arrested, and if you know the story, he ended up being moved from Jerusalem to Caesarea because people were trying to kill him. And Paul was in prison for two years, over two years. It was over two years from imprisonment to they leave on the ship, end up getting shipwrecked, and you can read that story. It's very exciting stuff. Well, what does that matter? Well, who's with Paul in that area, not in prison, free to roam around, taking care of Paul, but also has two years to do his research? That's Luke. When he says that he carefully investigated, what do you think Luke was doing while Peter, or rather while Paul, was in prison for two years? I think he was carefully investigating. In fact, if you ask me, David, why do you think Luke has the most detailed birth narrative? Because I think he did things like talk to people, I don't know, like maybe a lady named Mary. <laughs> Mary, tell me what that was like. I think he talked to the other disciples. And I think that's what he means by carefully investigated. And how cool is that? He uses the word narrative, which is a technical term for historical works, and, and that's cool because he's really making it clear that he was trying to be accurate, trying to be clear in his historical presentation of Jesus' life. We don't know quite who all he spoke with, and we don't know everything that he did, but we know he was a sharp person, he was motivated, he was capable of writing an accurate and clear defense of Jesus' life and the new faith of Christianity. Not only that, but we'd say he writes to defend the faith. And you say, well, what does that have to do with? Well, if you look there, you see that he, he calls Theophilus, and we think that probably is actually the guy's name. It literally means God lover, but we're pretty sure, you know, that probably was the guy. But he uses the term most honorable. The only other times most honorable is used in the book of Acts, or in the New Testament for that matter, is when it's used for Roman officials, Roman governors. And in fact, if you trace what Luke does, he constantly and consistently, both in the gospel and in the book of Acts, he portrays how Roman officials had an overall positive reaction both to Jesus and to Paul. Especially in Acts with Paul. Over and over, he, he shows how Paul was vindicated with Roman officials. And that's, that's important. Now, he, he wrote Acts 2. Let's look at the intro to the book of Acts. And then we're going to see what in the world all of this has to do with us today. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. And after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Again, notice, Luke is not interested in just bald assertions without any substance to him. He, he points out Jesus proved the resurrection through many convincing proofs, like, you know, walking through walls, appearing to people, then eating with them, showing up in different places. There was a lot that was going on. And Luke builds on that as you go through the book of Acts. But here's a question for you. 
as we think about this, as we think about the New Testament, our scripture, who wrote most of the New Testament? Well, that's a trick question. So you guys said Paul. And if you're talking about the number of books, that's correct. But if you're talking about content, Luke wrote 27.5% of the New Testament. Paul wrote 23.5% of the New Testament. Isn't that interesting? When it all comes down to this, do I think Paul knew that Luke was going to write Luke and Acts? That he was going to do all this research and defend the faith the way he did? No. I don't. See, I think Paul was just being Paul. And if you're around Paul, guess what you're going to hear about? You know how that is, right? See, if people are around some of us, they're going to hear a lot about politics. If people are around others of us, they're going to hear a lot about football. People around Cowboys fans are going to hear a lot of crying. <laughs> and if you were around Paul, you're going to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just who he was. I don't think Paul did anything a whole lot different with Luke than what he did with Silas or Timothy or Titus, or any of the others. Paul was just being Paul, and that meant preaching and teaching and talking to whoever would listen about Jesus. Christian beliefs, sound doctrine, sound living, Christian living, godliness. That's what he did. That's what he talked about. And Luke wasn't the only one to soak it up. Now, Luke could have been content with being a doctor. That's honorable. I mean, there are people, we look up to doctors, and we're thankful for doctors. And yet, the Holy Spirit of God called him to do something more. He wrote Luke and Acts under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We want to be really clear about that. God chose Luke to write Luke and Acts, to write 27.5% of the New Testament. Because why? Because Luke was gifted to do the research and do the writing and to defend the faith in the way that he did. God made him for that. I'm sure Paul loved it too. There's finally one more verse where Luke has mentioned that I want to look at uh, this morning. But in this verse, Luke is not the only one that is mentioned. 2 Timothy 4.11 only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. Now let's leave that one up there. Because this is great stuff. So we're in 2 Timothy. This is the dungeon imprisonment. This is the imprisonment, for, as far as we understand, shortly before Paul is martyred uh, by Caesar. And Luke is with him, and that makes sense because Luke's his doctor. And Luke's going to be with him, and Luke's going to help him. And he says, only Luke is with me. By the way, could you do me a favor, Tim? Could you bring Mark with you? Mark. First missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, Right? And John Mark flakes out. Time to kick off the second missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas say, let's go. Barnabas says, let's take John Mark. Paul says, I don't have time to fool with John Mark. He flaked on the last journey. I, I don't want to mess with him. Well, is this one on? Let's try this one. Are we on? 
Oh, our system died. Lovely. I'm going to yell now. <laughs> Sorry, Facebook. If you read carefully, it says that Barnabas and Paul came to the point of blows. And I can see Paul coming to the point of blows with people, but for Barnabas, to fight Barnabas, I'm like, how do you? Everybody loved Barnabas. It wasn't even his real name. It meant son of encouragement. They all had influence. And even when Paul was wrong, others didn't give up on guys like Mark. And in the end, God used all of them to give us this book that we treasure so much. Now, am I saying that if you use your influence for Christ? that the person that you influence is going to write some world-altering biography of Jesus. That's not exactly what I'm saying. But what I am saying is just like Albert and Mordecai had no idea that Billy would do what he did. The reality is Paul didn't have any idea It was how he lived, it's what he talked about, it's what he did. And because of that, we have the results of the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Now, you may, again, as we've talked about before, you may sit there and go, I am not Paul. Well, neither am I. You say, well, I'm not even Barnabas. I don't, I'm probably not going to claim that either. But you are you. And you know who you you know who knows exactly who you are better than you know who you are? God knows exactly who you are. And every day, whether it's in your home or in your work, it's at school, or it's at the store, it's at a restaurant. You are influencing the people around you. And for us as Christians, the only real question is this. Am I pointing them towards the cross? Or am I pointing them away? Am I influencing people for Jesus or no? 
Now, I'll tell you this. I remember back in high school, I got all these accolades, and one of the positions I got a lot of accolades for, believe it or not, was for kicker. And I said the school record and all this stuff, and it was great. Well, I mentored this kid that was a few years behind me, and I didn't even know why he had a football uniform on. I thought, Lord, if somebody hits this kid, he's going to break in half. Please protect him. Well, he turned out to be pretty good. And he turned out to play in college and do really well. And he even turned out to almost make it in the pros. He went further than I did. And the same thing happens to us in the Christian life. I want to pour into people. And I want to start at home. And I'm watching my kids in some ways already go further than I did. And there's been other people that I've been able to pour into and see them go and do things and be a part of things that I go, wow, I've never done that. And what's going to be my attitude now? What's going to be my reaction when I pour into somebody and lo and behold, they zoom past me? I am not going to be bitter and I am not going to be sad. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Use them, Lord. And if I got to play any small role in that, that's awesome that God would use one such as me. So as I wind it down this morning, I just want you to believe about yourself that you do influence people. And if we influence people for the cross, for Christ, our lives will be well spent. And I want to encourage us in response, consider your impact on others. It may be more than you think. It may be more than you think. Secondly, as we consider how do we live this out, how do we respond to this message, I think we should live our faith in such a way it's natural for us to point people to Jesus. I certainly think it didn't take long before Paul got to the point where he knew. Do you, do you think Paul was going, wow, what should I do? What should I say? What should I talk about? Hmm, should, I, should I bring Jesus up here? Should I? No. Again, it's just who Paul was. Now, when we're around certain people, we know we're going to hear certain things. When you're around your dad, you know you're going to hear that same joke again, right? And when you're around Paul, you knew you were going to hear about the gospel. And when you live your faith in such a way, it's natural for you to point people to Jesus. You no longer feel the pressure, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what should I do? No, it's just pouring out of you. And that comes through your study, through your obedience to God and the Holy Spirit at work in your life. It becomes natural. And finally, praise God. When you do pour into others, when you do influence others, pray that they go flying past you. Pray that they do things that that rock the world for Christ. Because it's not about them and it's not about you. It's about Jesus. And praise God he uses us. So I don't know if you've had people come to your mind, people that you feel like maybe I could have an influence on them, but if you had, that's a great thing for you to begin to really pray about as we come in a time of response. As always, I want to invite you that if you do not know the Lord Jesus, I want to talk with you about it. I'm going to be down here in just a moment. I don't have to worry about turning my microphone off because it's already off. If you're looking for a church home where people can influence you and you can influence others to a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ, 
then we want to invite you to be part of Emmanuel Baptist Church. And if you're here this morning and you doubt that you influence anybody, I want to ask you to pray to God that he will show you exactly who you might influence. But if you are here and you know that there are people you influence, then I want you to pray that God will help you to influence them well for his name. Lord, praise you for loving us. Praise you for people in our lives who influenced us to know and love and grow in you. Praise you for Paul and praise you for Luke and praise you for the others that we mentioned in this message that give us an example of how one generation, one spiritual generation influences the next. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to become a church of great gravitas, of influence for you in the Farmington area. That would be the greatest reason that we could exist to fulfill our mission from you. Lord, this time is your time, and we ask for you to do with it what you will as we open our hearts, our minds, our ears to your voice. Lord, have your way, we pray. In Jesus' name, let's stand together and let's respond to him this morning. i 
kingdom has no end. You may be seated. All right, amen. Hey, it is great to see the choir back up here, isn't it? Thank you, Daniel. A couple of quick announcements before we move on to Sunday school. The first is, last week we started a new set of three new members classes. The way we do these is if you would like to be a new member, we do ask that you come to all three classes. That being said, if you would like to be a new member and you missed last week, please do come today, um, and we will find a way to have that first class made up for you with the information that was shared. Yes, we have moved back to room 109, which has air conditioning. You'll be uh, grateful for that. So back to 109, and that's, that's immediately following service at 1030. So um, room 109 for those of you that would like to go. Also, some more exciting news. There is a new Bible study starting on October 2nd at 6 p.m. in room 108. Um, this study will be on the covenants of the Bible. If you are interested in attending, please contact Mike, and I think Mike is here. Mike, can you stand up or raise your hand just so everybody can see where you're at? Uh, please contact Mike, um, or you can come to the church office to find out more details. Again, that's going to begin on October 2nd at 6 p.m. in room 108, and that information is in your bulletin today. Some more exciting news. Tonight is our quarterly business meeting uh, right here in the sanctuary, and that's going to be that's going to be at 6 p.m. We've, we've been used to doing it at 7, so um, we're moving it to 6 p.m. a little bit earlier, so 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Uh, we do these quarterly now, so there's really no excuse for you not to come. There's only a Four of them, I think. Is that right? Four quarter? Four, okay. So now you can come to those. Um, some exciting stuff we'll be doing there tonight. Um, if you would like to give today, we still have our three ways you can give. You can go to ebfarmington.com and hit the Give tab. That's a pretty simple way. You can go see Bev in the church office Monday through Friday and set up automatic giving um, where she'll take your money without you even knowing about it. Or you can fill out your postage paid envelope in your bulletin today and you can mail that in. Um, we are grateful for your giving. Pastor David, Pastor Daniel, and I will be standing right here in front of the stage after service. If we haven't met you or it's been a really long time, we'd love to say hello to you. It's hard for us to walk every single aisle and see who you are and make sure you're doing okay. So we'd love for you to come say hello to us right after service. Sunday school is next. You guys have a great afternoon.